The Inner Ionosphere Report. The Urantia book says that an inner ionosphere exists about seven miles above the Earth's surface. Until recently, almost all atmospheric scientists believed that the only region where it is possible for an ionic layer to form starts at about 50 miles high. In the early 1990s, the documentation of blue jets at about seven miles high called into question this long-standing theory. When an electron gets broken off of an atom, it creates an ion. It has long been believed by atmospheric scientists that an ionic layer, an ionosphere, can only exist in the most upper regions of the atmosphere where the sun's rays are the most intense and the air is more rarefied. The aurora borealis is associated with this ionosphere. The wispy nature of the aurora borealis, or the northern lights, indicates how ions are freely available up in this region of the atmosphere. These pictures of blue jets show how they get wispy at the top, similar to the aurora borealis, and this is one of the things that indicates that an inner ionosphere exists at about seven miles high, where the Urantia book says one occurs. The speed at which blue jets shoot out of the top of storm clouds is so fast that literally scientists have concluded that there isn't time to break off electrons and then have the resulting ion glow, that there must already be ions in this region that are producing the luminescent effect of the blue jets. Known as the weather doctor, Keith Hydorn, Ph.D., writes in a November 1, 2005 article, the first reported in 1886 as unidentified oddities, it was not until the last decade that the meteorological community accepted their existence. The bias against acceptance of this phenomena in the scientific community is reflected in a National Geographic article from June 23, 2003, which states, Airplane pilots have spotted transient luminous events since the dawn of aviation, but many were afraid to report the flashes of light because of their elusive nature. They were afraid to report the flashes of light because they might be accused of drinking or otherwise being unfit to fly. This is how inconsistent the blue jet phenomena has been with traditional scientific opinions regarding ionic activity in Earth's atmosphere. Another peculiar aspect of this report has to do with the human source material that guided the presentation of scientific information in the Urantia book. The basic issue is that according to the Urantia book, the angels were limited in the types of scientific information that they could provide to us. Accordingly, they had to consider the human scientific material that was available at the time the Urantia book was being prepared. One person named Matthew Block took on the task of trying to find the various human source materials that would have affected the presentation of material in the Urantia book. Of all the things he found, an article by Harlan Stetson is one of the most striking examples of how it seems the authors of the Urantia book directly used scientific literature available at the time it was being created to guide them in their presentation of materials in the Urantia book. Stetson's article states, If we look at a cross-section of Earth's atmosphere, it may for convenience be divided into three zones or layers in which the stratosphere occupies the middle ground. The region below the stratosphere is that which contacts our immediate surroundings and provides the winds and atmospheric currents, giving rise to all our weather. We call this lower region, comprising perhaps the first five or six miles, the troposphere. The region above this stratosphere is the ionosphere. The Urantia book says, the lower five or six miles of Earth's atmosphere is the troposphere. This is a region of winds and air currents which provide weather phenomena. Above this region is the inner ionosphere, and next above is the stratosphere. In conclusion, the Urantia book said something very different from the human source material that seems to have guided its discussion about the Earth's atmosphere. It used to look like a serious error in the Urantia book. However, today, the blue jet phenomena 
powerfully supports the Urantia book's assertion of the existence of an inner ionosphere at about seven miles high. The Urantia book makes statements about how much information the angels were allowed to reveal. It says, The laws of revelation hamper us greatly by their prescription of the impartation of unearned or premature knowledge. Mankind should understand that we who participate in the revelation of truth are very rigorously limited by the instructions of our superiors. We are not at liberty to anticipate the scientific discoveries of a thousand years. We full well know that while the historic facts and religious truths of this series of revelatory presentations will stand on the records of the ages to come, within a few short years, Many of our statements regarding the physical sciences will stand in need of revision in consequence of additional scientific developments and new discoveries. Notice that the Urantia book has numerous qualifications about the scientific information that could be imparted to us. However, regarding historic facts, it says that this information will stand on the records of the ages to come. The Urantia book also states, Revelations are of immense value in that they at least transiently clarify knowledge by, one, the reduction of confusion by the authoritative elimination of error, two, the coordination of known or about-to-be-known facts and observations, three, the restoration of important bits of lost knowledge concerning the epical transactions in the distant past, four, the supplying of information which will fill in vital missing gaps in otherwise earned knowledge. Two of the most impressive reports relate to the Adam and Eve story, which in the Urantia book is considered an epical transaction in the distant past. It is also interesting to note that while the Urantia book says it could not anticipate the scientific discoveries of a thousand years, it does say that about-to-be-known facts and observations can be revealed. It's also important to keep in mind that if a revelation is going to reduce confusion by the authoritative elimination of error, then when it is presented, it necessarily must be in contradiction to information that is believed by scholarship and scientists, and that therefore it would take a period of time before our science and scholarship would catch up to this authoritative elimination of error. I hope you enjoyed this presentation about how science is catching up to the Urantia book. Thank you very much for listening, and you're of course encouraged to find out more about this information by exploring the ubthenews.com website.